Many of us who have been involved with concurrent enrollment programs for years have seen how the programs have been beneficial for students, teachers, and schools. However, to provide students with quality programs that prepare them for college and beyond in this, the 21st century, we always need to be mindful of the broader educational context. For example, now the implications of the Common Core standards and assessments and what that will mean for the last two years of high school. STEM education is another area where concurrent enrollment programs can play a critical role. The work of our next speaker, Dr. James Raleigh, can provide direction for those of us who are asking the question, what does it mean to provide quality STEM education? Dr. Raleigh will share his efforts to create a quality framework for science, technology, engineering, and math education. His work is grounded in his personal experience as a high school teacher, university professor, and a national semifinalist in the Teacher in Space program. <clears throat> Dr. Raleigh is professor of teacher education and executive director of the Institute for Technology Enhanced Learning at the University of Dayton. He has authored numerous articles, book chapters, and video-based professional development programs, and lectured throughout the United States and Britain. And as you will see in a few minutes, much, much more. Welcome, Jim. Good morning, everyone. Everybody say hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. Hi, everybody. Um, one of the things I've learned as a speaker over the years is that it's best not to compete with food. And my speech goes right up to 11.30. So I think I'm going to make an executive decision that I'm going to try to finish at 11.30. And then I'm going to be available um, during the time of the STEM panel. I'll be in this room before it starts. And I'd love to talk to you if you, you have any questions. So uh, let's plan to do it that way. Um, this is my third trip to Seattle in the last uh, year. I was getting to believe that this myth of rain in Seattle wasn't true, uh, so I'm, I'm glad I'm getting to see the, the real thing here. Uh, my first trip was about a year ago when I came out to work with Washington STEM, exciting new nonprofit here in Seattle that I think, in fact, recently was named the top new nonprofit in Seattle. They're a really exciting group of people, and I'm so pleased and proud to be working with them. I later came back to work with the Washington Alliance uh, for Better Schools. I was on a panel on STEM education, and one of the people in the audience was uh, Mona Kunzelman. And Mona then called me and said, Jim, come out to the NASEP conference. And I said, what is it? I don't know. And uh, so what I treat it has been to learn so much about your organization. And uh, so when, when Mona told me that the conference theme was launching students to success, I thought there's some serendipity operating here because um, I had not talked about my involvement in the teacher and space program for probably about 20 years. I uh, was very intensely involved in it um, before and after the tragedy. So this gave me an opportunity really to reflect on my own evolution as a STEM educator and to share with you some of the work that we're doing to try to bring clarity to the whole issue of what constitutes STEM. So helping students reach for the stars, of course, were the words of Krista McAuliffe um, from Concord, New Hampshire, the American history teacher, selected from over 13,000 applicants uh, to be the first private citizen in space and uh, the first teacher in space. And, and, um, and then to die, of course, tragically in the ill-fated mission of Challenger in 1986. Uh, I, and this is a very scary slide that uh, <laughs> for all the guys in the room that are in their late 30s, it's not pretty what happens next. <laughs> so uh, good, good luck with that. By the way, uh, <laughs> By the way, the high class certainly does not refer to me. I've never been accused of being that. It, in fact, refers to the fact that lessons would be taught from space. And, and Krista had lessons to teach uh, that were not taught uh, for almost 20 years until in 2007, Barbara Morgan from McCall, Idaho, 
uh, was able to fly and to complete uh, those lessons for Krista. So in, in uh, <laughs> you all know what that is, <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's the, it's the toilet on board the space shuttle. But of course, NASA can't call it a toilet, right? No way, because they have acronyms for everything. Solid rocket boosters or SRBs and extravehicular activities are EVAs. And the toilet is the WCS, the waste collection system, right? So a multi-multi-million dollar STEM project for sure. Lots of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in building that thing. So Chris and I were in, in Washington, D.C. in June of 1985, and as luck would have it, um, we were put in the same class. There were a hundred of us who were semifinalists, a little more than that actually. But in order to put us through these workshops uh, run by NASA personnel, they put us in groups, like reading groups, you know, the Bluebirds and the Redbirds, they put us in groups named after the shuttles. And so Krista and I were assigned to the Challenger uh, group. And so we sat uh, together. And of course, at the time, I knew nothing about the fact that she would be the selected one. But I remember one day, uh, the, we were doing a workshop called Living on Board the Shuttle. And it was a NASA guy that was doing the presentation. He was very bad. Uh, it, it was boring. And I don't handle boring very well. You could go back to St. Joseph's Elementary School and see all the check marks that I got for does not exercise self-control <laughs> and does not concentrate on the task at hand. So it was a very linear sort of, they didn't, I don't know if we had PowerPoint then. He was laying these fancy overheads on a projector one after the other. And I, I started skipping ahead trying to find something that was interesting. I certainly was interested in what in the world it was going to be like to go to the bathroom in space. So my luck, as luck would have it, somebody walks by, another NASA personnel walks by and sees me on the wrong page and says, hey, Al was the guy presenting. He says, hey, Al, look at this guy from Ohio back here. He's not paying attention. You know, we at NASA like to keep people on the same page. But who's you? Who are you? Oh, Jim Raleigh from Ohio. He doesn't like to be on the same page, Al. You know what he's reading? So he was embarrassing me in front of my competitors, these 24 people that I was trying to beat, right? So it was bad, and, and uh, he started going on and on. He picks up a glass. He says, Jim, I'll, you want to, I'll talk to you right now about it. He says, you know that hole there? He says, it's only the size of the top of that cup on your table. He says, how are you going to do that? I, I'm, I, he says, well, I'll tell you how you're going to do it. You're going to have to learn to be sealed and centered because you have to understand that you're going to be in a zero-gravity environment. Things don't fall away from the body. <laughs> you need mechanical assistance. You see, Jim? And in order to get that mechanical assistance, you've got to be sealed and centered. <laughs> yeah, think about that. <laughs> Fortunately, this woman from Tennessee, Bonnie Fake, says, but how will we know that we're sealed and centered? <laughs> and fortunately for me, he left me to go over to talk to Bonnie which I was thrilled about. And he went on to tell Bonnie that you would go, if you were selected to Houston, Texas, you would go to practice, which is exactly what Krista and Barbara did as they prepared for the mission. And that you would go to a room called the Moon Room. And that you would go in and you would practice sealing and centering on that little hole. <laughs> and that when you thought you were ready, you would hit a switch that would activate a video monitor mounted guessware that would give you, in, in NASA terminology, visual confirmation of <laughs> ceiling and center. Uh, we're, we're here today, perhaps, uh, to try to get that image out of your mind, to sort of seal our thoughts and to maybe center our thinking on what constitutes quality STEM education. You might say, well, why, why is that such a hard thing, Jim? It's pretty obvious. We know what it is. It's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It's STEM. So what's, what, you know, what's the big deal? Well, it's a big deal in the same way that this is a big deal. Go ask somebody on the street what concurrent enrollment is. I tell you the truth. I couldn't have given you a very good answer just a few days ago. I could give you a better answer now. 
But one of the things that I've learned from being at the conference is that there are many dif different visions of it, right, and many different programs that are happening. So in a similar way, I think we have some work to do. Uh, there are people that tell me that, well, it's STEM education. What, what is that? Is that we're studying plants? Is that? Is that I met one guy, he says, oh, I'm against that. He says, I'm against, I'm against STEM education. I says, how could you be against STEM education? He says, I have a moral opposition to that. I says, really? Moral opposition? He says, yeah, I don't believe in stem cell research or therapy. <laughs> so, so this is a problem, and if you don't think it's true, you can look at, uh, well, we, people could also argue this. That, okay, it's an advocacy movement for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, this is a risky slide. I'm no fool. I knew that. Right? If the polls are accurate, half of you don't like that slide, right? <laughs> so I'm running the risk of losing you for the rest of the presentation, but I'm here to tell you that if Mitt Romney is elected, you will see his face with kids talking about STEM education. <laughs> there is no question about it. Folks, we need 2.7, there are going to be 2.7 million new STEM jobs between now and 2018. We have work to do if we're going to fill those jobs. It's a major, major challenge. So in some respects, it's, it's a rather apolitical uh, thing. Take a look at this. Natalie Angier, writing in the New York Times just a few years ago, said that when she did a, they did a survey that 86% of 5,000 people said, no, we don't get it. I don't, we don't know what, what STEM education is. So, I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about the work that I've done to try to help view STEM as more than an advocacy movement, right, and to view it as potentially a distinctive educational initiative that has unique qualities and characteristics that, if done well, can make this a very, very special uh, new educational initiative. So today I want to talk to you about what that looks like. I want to share with you how we developed it, just briefly on that, a little bit about my own personal history of how I came to it, and then close with some thoughts about what are the implications for concurrent, concurrent enrollment uh, programs. So I, was a, I started out as a high school teacher, social studies, graduated from the University of Dayton, taught social studies for three years, and then a new program opened up at Miami University, the Institute for Environmental Sciences. And I, I always have had a great love for the out of doors, and of course it was the 70s, so there was a great concern about the environment and Earth Day and all of those things that sort of launched our environmental awareness. So I signed up and I met my first really STEM mentor, uh, a guy by the name of Dr. Gary Barrett, who's now the Eugene Odom Chair of Ecology at the University of Georgia. Gary was a visionary guy who created this institute to train people to do interdisciplinary problem solving using the environmental problem solving process. It really was in, my, in a way, and I didn't even know it, my introduction to engineering design because that's what it was. It was taking these complex problems, bringing people from different disciplines together to work on them. So I went back to Centerville, taught a course that I created called Environmental Studies, taught it as an interdisciplinary course, bringing the social and scientific aspects to bear. And I did that for 12 years. 12 years later, uh, something interesting was happening to me. It's probably happened to many of you in the room. Uh, even though I was, and I say this not in any, with any kind of sense of vanity, but to make a point, uh, I had been selected three times as Teacher of the Year in the school. I had been National Teacher of the Year in my academic discipline. I had gotten more affirmation of my work than any teacher ever deserves, and I was losing uh, meaningfulness of the work. I, I look back and I think now I was bored. I had taught the same course for 12 years, even though I had total freedom to recreate it. I was getting restless. I was thinking the other day that I'm, I wonder what would have happened to me if there had been a concurrent enrollment program as a teacher and I had a chance to stretch myself and start interacting with university people. I might have not had to spend all that time getting a PhD and leaving. <laughs> Right? And, and doing the t tenure track and all of that things. But for many teachers, there's not an option. The expectation is you do your work for 30, 35 years, and you do it well, and you do the same thing. And if you don't want to be an administrator, get over it. It's a problem. We have a very flat profession. And uh, being at this conference is, is really, really stimulating me to think uh, hard about the leadership opportunities for teachers back home. 
So I was ready. I was ready for change. My students brought me a flyer one day and says, Mr. Raleigh, we think you ought to go to space. <laughs> Soon. <laughs> so they literally gave me the application. I, and I read it. And the one part that really fascinated me was it said, if you're picked, you get a year off school. You get to go on a year-long sabbatical, travel all over the world, and talk about your experiences in space. I signed up. I mean, I filled out the application. 40,000 people wrote for the application, 13,000 uh, filled it out. So I filled it out and was fortunate enough to be selected as a semifinalist. And that was the beginning of a wonderful experience. Uh, Krista, of course, um, was selected in July of 1986. And I was very disappointed at the point, that point in time. Why not me? You know, what, what did I do wrong? You know, what, you know, all the things you go through, you know. And then, of course, you don't know you're going to be a lucky loser for the rest of your life, right? So, uh, Kristen and Barbara soon found themselves uh, training uh, in Houston, Texas. And then came the morning of January uh, 28th, uh, 1986. I had been in Florida for four days prior to the launch uh, NASA brought all the semifinalists there. We were in meetings. We were meeting with folks. We had a chance to hear Krista speak and so forth before the launch. It was a very uh, surreal thing. Uh, I was there for five days. The, the, the launch kept getting delayed, as many of you might remember. And finally, I decided I just can't stay. I'm going to go home. So I went home, uh, was in my class the next day. Uh, with three TV cameras uh, in the room. I was wired for sound, and I was leading my students through an explanation of what the launch would be uh, when it all went uh, very wrong. So um, one of my other motivations for being the teacher in space was I always wanted to be on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. <laughs> Krista was on there within 24 hours after being picked. So I didn't make The Tonight Show, but I made The Today Show the next morning with Jane Polly, uh, because the images of me in my classroom had been captured on film and were shared with the national networks. And um, that's a whole another story. Uh, I wasn't so concerned about myself as I was for the, the families, of course, who were suffering this tragic loss. But I just, it was just an unfortunate thing. I was trying to get my students a break, but these people with cameras never know when to turn them off. I literally said, would you please stop filming? And of course, uh, they didn't. So we learned a lot from this terrible thing, uh, this STEM problem. Um, we learned an awful lot, of course, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, but it changed many lives profoundly, including mine. Um, I decided after this that if I was crazy enough to apply to be a teacher in space, that I could take a sabbatical and go work on my graduate work. So I went to Ohio State and got my PhD. I, was, I continue to read about the lives of these people. They're a remarkable group, incredibly diverse, representative of our country in, in so many interesting ways. There's so many stories I could tell you about them, but time does not allow. I can tell you this, that every one of them has a remarkable st story about a teacher or a mentor who at some point entered their lives and changed it uh, in profound and significant ways and, and took them off into a whole uh, another direction. For me, I went to the University of Dayton, began training teachers. And the first thing I did was because I felt I wanted to bring some closure for myself personally, um, I wanted to help the Challenger families uh, start to fulfill their dream of creating an international network of space science learning centers called Challenger Centers. There are now 45 operating in four countries, impacting at this point over 4 million students. We built the first one in a public school system in Dayton, Ohio. We were the fourth Challenger Center to come online. And I directed it for a year or two until my dean said, you know, it might be time to start doing what we're paying you to do, <laughs> which is to teach well and write articles. So off we go. I spent a lot of my early years learning about problem-based and project-based learning. I was discovering that that's what I was doing as a high school teacher, but I didn't know it. 
so that many of the practices that I had been doing, I now had names for. And I began to think about ways to train teachers to use these methodologies. And then along in 2007 came the Dayton Regional STEM Center, funded by the National Governors Association for one year as a pilot site. And uh, they, they were having problems in their first year because their, their intention was to bring business and industry people together along with classroom teachers and to have the industry STEM professionals, these would be researchers and engineers from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, from our local laser companies, all these high-tech advanced manufacturing companies were going to send employees and they were going to actually work with the K-12 teachers to develop curriculum. They were having trouble. <laughs> Can you imagine? They were talking past each other in so many interesting ways. Here's all these people with this wonderfully deep content knowledge, right? And then these other people with practical day-to-day -day experience in schools. They could not find the common ground to really drive the conversation forward, and that's when they hired me to develop some kind of a STEM education framework, Jim, that would try to help us identify what this is really all about. And so that was the, really the beginning of my work. Um, we're going to share it with you here just in a minute or two, but it consists of 10 quality components that are, as it says there, articulated over four performance levels. I'll show you one of them in a minute. It was developed in collaboration with lots of people in the room, business and industry folks, sitting there listening to them talk about what they needed and wanted from, from our graduates. And then finally, a year ago, we validated it in a construct validity study using the Delphi method and bringing about 18 professionals from across the country together to look at it and to say, uh, well, I'm not sure about that, Jim. You need to tweak that or you need to fix that or, or whatever. So the real final validation came uh, just last summer in Dallas, Texas at a STEM summit uh, sponsored by U.S. News and World Re Report uh, where a new organization called STEMX was created. STEMX is a 14-state uh, network of folks who are committed to trying to drive policy changes across the country in, uh, in the legislatures and trying to advance uh, a deeper understanding of, of what STEM education is and what it could be. And uh, my framework was adopted given, given the STEMX seal of approval. I've always wanted a seal of approval, uh, and I, I now actually have one. Um, and... Um, in fact, I'll take you to their website. I encourage you to go there. Uh, you can see all of the states. Maybe yours is there. Um, the map shows the current membership. I'm sure it will grow. And all the different organizations from those states uh, that are uh, participating. So a bit about what it is and what it's not. First of all, the STEM quality framework um, is a guide to scaffold PK to 20 teachers in STEM ed instructional design. We have not only had third grade teachers and high school teachers, but we've also had PhDs who teach at the Air Force Research Laboratories in Dayton go through the training. That's an interesting day when you have those folks all in a room watching a videotape of a STEM lesson and then deconstructing it using the framework. Wonderful, wonderful, deep uh, conversations. So it's a set of principles that helps us conceptualize what STEM ed is. It's a metacognitive tool for teachers to, to think about and reflect on their own work and say, gee whiz, wow, I, I wasn't aware that I'm not doing that. Or, oh, oh gee whiz, I'm, I'm doing that uh, very well. So it, it's a vision of STEM ed. Uh, it's a formative assessment tool. I won't bother to tell you all the things that it's not, but it, it's not a prescriptive methodology. It's not a substitute for the standards of all those professional organizations and so forth and so on. Here's an example uh, of what each one of the quality components look like. This, this one happens to be on the quality of the cognitive task, which says that learning experiences ought to challenge students to develop their higher order thinking skills through processes such as inquiry, problem solving, and creative thinking. And then it shows you what that might look like across, across four performance levels. So, number one, potential for engaging students of diverse academic backgrounds. Folks, we need, we need 2.7 million jobs by 2018, but we don't need that many PhDs. We need certificated people, we need technicians, we need associate's degrees 
there are living wages to be made by many, many people. And for many people, those jobs could represent an opportunity to break the cycle of poverty that their families have been in for many years. But our students will not know about those jobs unless we become intentional about it. And unless we begin to realize that STEM education is not just for the best and the brightest, that it's not about STEM academies and institutes for the gifted, although it could be, but that it's about all kids. Dick Scobie, the commander of the Space Shuttle Challenger, was not a good high school student. He got C's. He was much more interested in getting home to work on his car. He was very interested in mechanics. The commander of the Challenger enlisted in the Air Force as an enlisted man and as a mechanic. And then said, I'd like to try, as people began offering him opportunities, and he eventually ended up commanding uh, a space shuttle. And you've all heard those stories so many times. It's about expectations. This is a real challenge, particularly for all of you who work in high school environments where integration does not come easily. Integration happens every day in the STEM field. That's the only way the work gets done. It's the only way the space shuttle toilet get built, is that people have to work together across disciplines to figure it out, right? But we don't do it that way in school. We, everything happens in courses. And, and uh, for how many years have we been trying to break through some of those barriers with very little success? We have to try harder, because when we fail to help students see the nexus between at least a couple of the disciplines, I think we've missed the opportunity to help STEM really be the distinctive educational initiative that it could be. Connections to non-STEM disciplines. I care about the arts deeply. And so STEM education is so, so getting so advanced and so much attention, it, it, it hurts me when I see it come at the expense of some of these other disciplines. If you're going to be a successful STEM professional, you need to, quote, read and write across the problem, just like we're reading and writing or should be reading and writing across the curriculum in schools, right? And that's where it can start. But it also needs to begin to advance the notion that these STEM problems and the STEM products that are technical in nature have profound social, cultural, and environmental impacts. How can we get kids reading about those things as they're working in math and science class on the more technical um, side of, of the problem? The integrity of the academic content is obviously always central. Uh, we have to be sure that, that, that students are getting the knowledge and skills that they need. And uh, with the Common Core and other standards around um, the country, um, we have lots of guidance on that. The challenge is how to make that knowledge stick. Where's the stickiness? Because all of us in this room can talk about the things we've learned and quickly forgot. So we have to work really hard to think about how we can help our students retain this knowledge. And there's lots of research to demonstrate that by learning to deal with these issues in the context of a situation or a problem or a project, that they will learn to apply and, and synthesize the information in ways that they would not in more traditional classrooms. That doesn't mean that the lecture is dead. It doesn't mean the teacher direct instruction is out the window. It just means that we have to blend those approaches so that the knowledge and the skills stick. Now, those don't look like high poverty students to me. I don't want to make any judgments about them. But uh, they don't look too engaged to me either. They look like they're suffering a little bit. Um, with, when it comes to the kinds of, of issues that Stan was talking yesterday morning about, and some of those statistics were just heart-wrenching, really. Uh, I thought of the work of Martin Haberman. I had the great pleasure of working with Marty before he passed. Martin was one of the leading authorities in this country on teaching children of poverty. And um, he often talked about the importance of, of, of projects and problems with these kids because his argument was they have to fall in love with learning. That's their only way out, is education. And if they don't fall in love with the, with the whole notion of learning, then they're doomed to continue the cycle of poverty. 
Now, what does it mean to have someone fall in love? Well, number one, you better have some early, you better have some successes. We don't tend to persist on things that we are repeatedly failing at, right? And we don't tend to persist on things that we see no relevance in, no relationship to our lives. So there's a great opportunity, again, to revisit the importance of anchored instruction, um, of situated cognition, of trying to place students in those powerful learning environments. This is a big one. In my research study, this was one of the weakest. It barely made our convergence standard. Teachers are too busy. I don't have time for career education. What are you talking about? And yet, if we don't help students see themselves in a future, they may not ever figure it out. And so how can we do this? We can do this in all kinds of, 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 of ways. We can bring in, and I, and I hate to do this, well, I'm an old guy myself, so I'm saying we need to bring in young, vibrant, enthusiastic STEM professionals and get them in there with kids talking about the work they do and talking about what it took for them to get there. We need those kinds of models and examples. I'm not going to, if I talk, talk to some 19-year-old uh, about being a teacher and they look at me, I'm going, Holy smokes, man, I, uh, what are you talking about? They need to be talking to that young person who has chosen this work and is attacking it and loving it. Uh, we can bring in guest speakers, but more importantly, the thing that we can do is to try to move toward models of cognitive apprenticeship which actually put kids in environments that feel like the STEM workplace. Now, some people are going, I don't, we don't have enough money for that, we can't do it. Yeah, you can. Use your imagination. Simulate it as if they were trying uh, to work in the context of being an engineer um, or a research scientist. But we have to be intentional about it. I was telling someone at dinner the other night that uh, you would think this might be obvious, this notion of collaborative learning. Uh, the research is so strong on the power of social interaction, and yet it doesn't happen in a lot of classrooms. For me, that constitutes essentially malpractice. That's how much we know about the power of cooperative learning, especially formal forms of it versus informal get together in a group and talk. And when I listened to the STEM professionals at the Dayton Regional STEM Center, and they said, what, well, what do, you, what do we want? They inevitably would say, they would repeatedly say, give us people that can get work done on their own, who can take responsibility for a project and see it through, but at the same time have the capacity to take that work to others and interact with them and take the feedback and go back and fix it. And I'm not, I don't know whose fault it is, but it was very, very clear that, that they didn't feel like they were getting that, that nothing in their college education had prepared them uh, to work effectively as a team. And yet it's exactly what we need in the STEM fields and so many other uh, fields of human endeavor. Assessments need to change. It doesn't mean we need to throw out all of our tests and quizzes and all of our traditional measures. It doesn't mean that. But it does mean that we need assessments that are motivational. We need assessments that kids get a redo. They get a, because you know what? That's life. Redos are life. Do you know how many times I've redone this presentation? <laughs> a bunch. And I'm sure after today, there'll be some more redos. At the Dayton Regional STEM Center, we like to say to one another, as we're going about doing the curriculum design and development work, we'll say to one another or to somebody who's a stranger or a visitor, we say, we do engineering design here every day. That's what we do. We're not building cars or robots, the kids might be, but we as professionals are, are, are doing that. We're, we're, it, we're redoing, and so we need those kinds of assessments as well. Performance-based, authentic assessments that give, it, that give kids a chance to shine in ways that they may not uh, ordinarily. And I've already kind of alluded to this, the engineering design pr process, very elusive. What do you mean, engineering design? I'm not an engineer, Why, I, how can I do that? It's really pretty simple. If you look out there and you do, it, do some search, you'll find engineering design models for elementary kids. You'll find it for college. It's a way of thinking. It's the way of thinking that any successful person does, particularly in the STEM fields. 
I actually got a chance a couple years ago, I was invited uh, to teach a Berry Scholars class. The Berry Scholars are the top students that come to the University of Dayton. They're scary smart. And they said, Jim, would you teach them the, uh, in a seminar called Engineering Design? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not any, I, what do you mean? I don't know anything about engineering design. They said, well, no, but you know about problem-based and project-based learning. You know what it takes to, to work through complex situ situations. So I said, why not? I'll, I'll try. So I did, and we ended up taking on a problem. We're a Marianist Catholic school. We have missions around the world. One of them uh, is a school uh, called Our Lady of Nazareth School in the Kwanjenga, Makuro Kwanjenga slums outside of Kenya. Um, and we decided to help that school by building a science center for them. So we had these 24 college students learning about life in, in Kenya. And what, just a mind-boggling experience for me. I actually traveled there came back that summer, my students went there, um, he fully equipped the building, they wrote the curriculum, they trained the teachers. Um, it was an unforgettable experience. And I never once talked to them about engineering design. We just did it. <laughs> we figured it out. And of course, there's tremendous possibilities with technology integration, but the main thing here is we need to get the technology in the hands of the students. The teacher doesn't need to, we, I mean, it's a, they can demonstrate it, but how can we get students using the technology to solve these problems and to work on these projects that we challenge them with? So if you think about this, and I don't know what your reactions are um, at this point. I don't know if you're going, well, Jim, gee whiz, that sounds like a lot. Or gee whiz, Jim, that sounds like a lot of what we know about just good teaching and learning. Uh, you'd be right on both fronts. It is a lot. And it is based on what we know about um, effective instruction. So how do we move teachers and university professors forward with, with that vision of STEM? Uh, how do we find what I call fidelity? Uh, the analog that comes to me is that of an audio synthesizer or equalizer. I'm not sure which exactly is the correct term. But you've all seen it, right? You, on TV, there's a singer in a room. And, then on the other side of the glass, somebody is sliding these uh, buttons back and forth. Um, that's sort of how I think about it. If we took professional development and tried to drive professors and teachers forward on all 10 of these things and ramp them up to the highest level on my rubric, we would have mutiny. People would be going, wait a minute, that's too much. I cannot do it. I think the challenge is to have them begin to experiment with increasing the energy, boosting the energy, as the technical term is, on those areas that they know they're weak. Maybe they're, they've never used collaborative learning. Maybe they're not doing projects. Uh, maybe they, they've never been intentional about the career connections. Can we begin to move them forward uh, on those areas? Maybe someday they'll be maestros. Maybe some days they'll be the mixer who has the knowledge of all 10 so that they can then masterfully design lessons that have true STEM fidelity. So very quickly in the time that I have left, I have two things to do. I want to show you some resources that you can access after the conference. I think you'll enjoy them a lot. They're very, very rich. And then I want to conclude with those remarks that I promised you about the relationship to concurrent enrollment. So first, let me take you, I hope, uh, to the Dayton Regional STEM Center, where you, I, we don't have enough time to explore this site, but please do. You're going to find everything there that, that I think you're interested in. You're going to find out about who's paying the bills, who are our sponsors, who are the local companies who have stepped forward, what local universities and community colleges have decided to join us, right? You're also going to find lessons built by these, these teams of curriculum developers, including business and industry folks. And of course, you're going to find the framework. You can even, if we had time, you could watch this little video featuring somebody you now know talking about the framework a little bit. But more importantly, you'll listen to teachers and students talk about their experiences. But the framework um, you'll find here. And of course, you can, you can download it. Um, 
it's right here, all 10 components uh, and the associated uh, rubrics. Now, oops, I don't want to do that. I'm so proud and pleased that of this association that the Dayton Regional STEM Center now has with Washington STEM right here in Seattle. Uh, they approached us to say, we want to take your framework and move it forward to another level. And so they've done that. If you go here uh, to Washington STEM, uh, you can go online. And they've created an assessment where teachers and, and professors and others interested in STEM education can actually take a little self-assessment, reflect on where they think they are currently at. So if you click, if you work your way down here and you click on all of these buttons, it will print out what amounts to you to be kind of that audio equalizer thing. It will show you sort of where your strengths and weaknesses are, which I think is, is, uh, is kind of cool. So people can, can begin thinking about what they would like to learn. And then the other thing that I was able to do recently for them uh, in collaboration with them is that once you've looked at your inventory, if you have a low score, you can click on that and it will take you and give you what I'm calling guiding components um, and aligned practices for planning instruction, teaching, and assessing instruction that would help you move forward with that particular practice. So lots to play around with here um, at, at Washington STEM uh, as well. Please go there. Both places are great. So here's some, here's some opportunities. Um, I think you have a great, great opportunity. You're so, you're, you're perfectly positioned to help higher ed professors, secondary teachers, administrators move toward adopting a shared understanding of STEM education. I think you're going to have trouble if you don't do that. I think you're going to talk past each other. Now I'm not going to say that it's going to result in the loss of a space shuttle, but that's exactly what happened to Challenger. There were technical flaws, there's no question. But it should never have happened. People were talking past each other. The shuttle was never meant to fly in 32 degrees temperatures. It was 18 degrees overnight. People knew that. And people, the people who knew it, tried to tell other people and they were ignored. One of the most powerful lessons I took away from my experience is that we need to listen carefully to the people who are closest to the product. So don't talk past each other. Look, my framework is I don't want all, people are not going to sing kumbaya. They're, this is going to be hard conversations. People are going to go, what's he talking about? I know that. That's okay. Look, I'm not standing here before you pretending that I have the answer. What I've done, along with the help of the State and Regional STEM Center folks, is put a stake in the ground and say, let's start here. We're going to build a program from here. If you don't like it, go build your own framework. Or if you want to take advantage of the work we've done, pick it up and use it. Modify it if you want. It's going to, it's going to change. It's going to evolve. This business that you're in, I, I mean, I just really, now I kind of understand almost, I hope you do, why I'm here. Uh, I wasn't sure at first <laughs> when I was invited, but you all are in the business of course design and development. Am I right? And you have these higher ed people and your secondary people thinking about these STEM courses. How cool is that? Now, what are they going to do? Where are they going to begin? What are they going to try to accomplish? What is the end product going to look like? I'm hopeful that you'll think that the STEM framework might be a logical place for them to start. And again, I, I keep coming back to this because this is really what it's all about. Helping students begin to imagine themselves in a STEM future. Do you know that during the recent recession there were about 3.6 applicants for every one job? in the general uh, arena of job market. Even though it was still tough in the STEM field, it was a much lower ratio, about 1.9.
So there were doors open during, during this recession, and that door is going to swing wide again uh, as we begin to recover as we will, regardless of who's in office. We're going to recover, right? We will. And there are going to be jobs, and there are going to be kids looking for a future. What can you do to help them see a future that without you, they would have never imagined? Your challenges, the conversations are going to be hard. Building a shared vision is never easy. That's OK. Welcome it. Welcome the dissonance. Welcome uh, the diversity of opinion. It's fine. But have the conversation. Decide who needs to be in the room. And put the, pipe, put the right people in the room. Put your business and industry leaders. Put your local community leadership council, your business committee. Put them in the room. Put some teachers in the room, some parents. And walk them through some kind of an experience that gets them talking about what this is all about and how truly important it is. We have a problem. <laughs> I think, I don't know, maybe, I, you know, you leave for 20 years and they tell you, you know, well, you're done. You know, you, you couldn't possibly know anything about teaching. You haven't taught for 20 years, you know. So I don't know, but I always found the high school curriculum to be a rather inflexible beast. You're an, can you become advocates for change? Can you push? I love to push for little pilots. That's my favorite word. I've got so much done in my life by telling people in charge, it's just a pilot, <laughs> right? Who's to care? We'll see, right? So try to, <clears throat> try to push for those little pilots, those little experiments um, to see if we can, can foster some change. And maybe your biggest challenge, perhaps, is moving professors and teachers forward. How can we get them to, to experiment with professional practices, with teaching strategies that call for experimentation and, and, and risk taking? How do we get them to move out of their comfort zone and to move forward? And I know you're all about professional development, and I think this is, should be and could be a driving force. And let's say one last thing about professional development, folks in the STEM field or in any field. You do, this, you do do all the people in the room a great in service if you do what I'm doing to you today. Okay, this is not my preferred style, okay? When you do PD, you wanna place those folks in the same kind of a learning environment that you're trying to get them to create. So you need to immerse them in PD that looks and feels like quality STEM education. Talking about it is not going to get them there. They need to experience it. So I'll conclude by just by, by talking a little bit about persistence. And for me, uh, no greater model. There are many, but for sure, for me personally, one great model of that is Barbara Morgan from Idaho, who is now at Boise State University as a distinguished uh, educator and driving STEM initiatives. Uh, working at, with a dual appointment in education and engineering. What a great, what a great job. What a perfect job for Barbara, who for 20 years not only went back to McCall, Idaho and taught, but kept involved with NASA and kept moving forward, trying to help get us to a day when perhaps she could fly and complete Krista's mission. She hung in there until that time came. And folks, when she flew, she did not fly as a space flight participant. She flew as a mission specialist, a full trained astronaut. In fact, who had worked in Capcom for, in the communications center for many missions. And that's the kind of persistence we need. Uh, I read a quote once in which Barbara said, there's a great sense of pride to be involved in a human endeavor. And this next part is the part I like, that takes us all a little bit further. That's what I think you all are about, trying to take your concurrent and role programs and maybe your STEM initiatives a little bit further. How can you push them and make that happen? Because as Barbara said, when you look down and see our Earth and you realize that we are trying to do as a human race, it's pretty profound. Certainly the work you're trying to do 
to create these new futures for young people is profound. And with your persistent effort, I'm totally confident that they will, as Krista said, reach for the stars. Thank you very much. It's 1129, not bad, huh? <laughs>